So hello and welcome everybody. Just a nice informal chat um, with me, Nikki Scott from UK High Progressives. Um, just really to come in this month and talk to you about anything that might be concerning you. Um, just any questions that you have around high progressives. Um, and I know that sometimes people dry up a little bit. Um, uh, yeah, that's fine. If you want to turn your video off, Sandra, that's absolutely fine. Anybody that doesn't want to be seen on YouTube. Um, I think mostly it's the person that's talking that is videoed. So I don't think it's the whole screen when it comes up. But yeah, if you if you really don't want to be seen on YouTube, then you can turn your video off and still participate. Um, so, oh, everyone's disappearing now. <laughs> I shouldn't have said that, should I? Um, so yes, this is just your chance really to use this hour to ask me any questions that you might have. So you can um, give me a reaction, a hands up, um, if you've got a question that you want to ask me tonight. So if anybody's got a question, um, good. So unmute yourself, Jo, Joanne. That's it. Hello. Nice to see you. Um, well, thanks. Well, I'm really, really enjoying High Progressives, really enjoying it loads. Um, I'm finding it quite tricky to explain High Progressives yep. to people in a, I mean, I can explain it in a lengthy fashion. I, say, for instance, I'm teaching um, a class and I just want to touch on it and include a little bit. So sometimes there might be different people coming to the class because, you know, sometimes I teach in a health club. So it won't always be the same people. So it requires me to just, I want to try and kind of sell it to people so that they can know the benefits. And then that I want to be able to cover the obvious questions they're going to give me in a kind of a sort of a roundup. And I'm finding it really hard. I just end up getting a bit tongue-tied and sounding ridiculous. So I suppose my answer to that would be it would depend on your audience. So obviously, sometimes you're going to have um, maybe a, a completely female um, group of older ladies that have, might have come to it from a different perspective to, say, a postnatal group. So the way you might talk about it would be ever so slightly different depending on who you've got in the room. Um, but when I'm when I'm running taster sessions, I talk about it as a whole body system. So it works on everything as opposed to maybe what people have tried in the room. You could ask people if they tried to do pelvic floor exercises in the past and what type of ask them what type of things that they've done in the past mm -hmm. and then explain why it's different to that. So, mm -hmm. you know, for example, doing Kegels consciously squeezing we don't just need that conscious side of our muscles working we need the subconscious side as well and to explain the subconscious a good way to explain it would be um, to talk about when you have a sneeze and you can't you don't always have time to consciously contract everything yeah to, to handle the pressure of the sneeze so yeah I mean it's 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 a tricky one I know but it, it's it's an alternative to pelvic floor, traditional pelvic floor work, that works di very differently. It works much more on getting that um, reflexive. Hello, Roz. <laughs> that reflexive core working. So reflexive means that it works uh, when you're not telling it to work. Yeah, that's kind of what I've been telling them. Um, and the reason that the reason that pelvic floor traditional pelvic floor squeeze type exercises on their own are pretty rubbish for most people is because they're only ever training that conscious contraction yeah and they're just working on one part of their body yeah so rather than thinking about their body as a whole they're being given an exercise that just trains the pelvic floor yeah. and we know that everything's connected we know that we're this myofascial web we know that we need to unpick that and and get rid of the tensions general tensions in that web in order for everything to work properly and if you're yeah. if you're doing a squeeze and you're creating more tension in an area where you've got loads of tension anyway then it's just going to make everything worse so you're a you're a, a person from personal training background if you 
just got someone to train that you know say you had a woman and you were just doing chest exercises all the time yeah. chest yeah. exercises they would become really tight and sore in this area which is just not what we want is it because that doesn't make the rest of their body function properly so why would we just train the pelvic floor and squeeze and squeeze and squeeze and squeeze and that all that does is over tighten everything doesn't make it particularly strong just makes it really tight and dysfunctional yeah um, so yeah it's it is a tough one but and I used to struggle in the beginning but you you just kind of have to find your way with whoever's in the room yeah yeah okay well thank you for that that does talking help about the, um talking about the core being like a house is a good one that's how I describe it in my Pilates classes actually, yeah already. yeah so um, it's like, this, like this house and everything in the house has to function in order to hold the house up but it's yeah, I have been saying that and I have been um, explaining um, about the uh, I mean I were, was already explaining about the lateral breath even before I did hyperpressives but now I'm kind of really pushing that home at the beginning of the class to try and get people to practice as well away from the class not hyperpressives but the lateral breath yeah um to help and i sold it today to a lot of people to help them with their posture because i had all different age groups yeah um so, so, so I found for my major, posture it's made a huge difference yeah posture is a major one for um any anybody that's in in the, the kind of over 50s mm. because the, you know if you're already if if people are saying i mean i hear this all the time oh my posture is terrible mm. well do something about it because it's only going to get worse yeah tension you have in the front of your body is just going to keep pulling you forward and that's why you see those old ladies that are kind of two or three or four inches shorter than they used to be some of that is the aging and everything compressing but if we stay long and stretched well, that doesn't have to happen mm -hmm. and well it doesn't have to happen to that extent where you're kind of really hunched forward so it makes a massive difference to so many parts it's um maybe maybe what you should do is pick one bit that you're confident talking about and talk about that in that class and then when you do the class the following week you can highlight another point and maybe just say each week I'm going to highlight different points as yeah. what it can help because that way then then you know you might talk so generally that people don't really get it whereas if you talk about specific things and people have got those things wrong with them they'll understand how it's going to fix them yeah yeah or how it might help to fix them so with the contraindications so it's, you know if somebody's there with their high blood pressure um or their heart condition um so that's why i've just been sticking with the lateral breath breath really in the so high blood pressure high blood pressure isn't really a red flag it's no. just one that you'd have to monitor yeah that's that's what i mean so if you've got a class full of people that you don't really know uh, that's why I've just been doing the lateral breathing. If it's if it's people that I know, like clients and sessions or a little small group, then that's fine. But with this is why I've just been sticking to the lateral breath with a bigger. Well, again, you could go in and say, show of hands, anybody got a, a heart a diagnosis yeah. heart condition? Leave this bit out. Yeah. So I, could do that. I just need more confidence, don't I? That's what it is. Absolutely, and that just comes with with. The more you do yeah. it actually. i i mean it probably sounds like i'm being a bit blasé about things like blood pressure but in the beginning i was really nervous about anybody with high blood pressure and actually i did have one person who i refused to do the do hyperpressives with because it was off the scale but in in all of my experience now i very very rarely ever ask about blood pressure because i know that the mechanics of the breathing bring blood pressure down so that it actually has a calming and de-stressing effect rather than the opposite. I see. Yeah. So uh, unless you have, if someone says to you, look, I, I really do have problems with my blood pressure, you would say to them, well, I, I think until you've got your own blood pressure monitor, you can bring it with you, um, or unless you've got one where you work, yeah. you can monitor it throughout the class, just get that person to, to retake it after 10 or 15 minutes, um, and then just kind of see what's happening with it yeah and if it continues to go up then maybe it's and you know and, and by the end of the day it's still quite raised then you would just probably say to that person that it's probably not for them at the moment yeah yeah 
I mean, heart conditions, definite no-no unless you've got um, sign off from their cardiology team. Yeah, they still benefit from the lateral breathing though, wouldn't they? Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Okay, thank you, Nikki. No worries, nice to talk to you. Um, so Jo is saying, I was so fit before I experienced my prolapse. I actually believe that my lifting weights contributed to the problem. Um, I had a surgical pelvic floor repair and either it failed or it's occurred again. What I'd really like to do is to return to my previous level of fitness as currently I'm afraid to do anything at all apart from swim. If I practice hyper presses, we'll be able to, to gain some level of fitness again. It's, it's more about function than it is about fitness, Jo. Um, so if you've had a prolapse, prolapse is caused usually through tension and not weakness. So prolapse, a lot of women um, experience prolapse coming into the menopause or postnatally and postnatally usually because- but Can you just turn it down a minute? <laughs> Let's just mute everyone. There we go. Um, yeah, and so postnatally it's often because of birth scars. So episiotomy, um, tears, any birth trauma that you might have had will cause um, scarring and scar tissue. Uh, and the scar tissue will cause tension um, in some areas and laxity in others where it's pulling um, on the tissue around it. And it's again, thinking about the body as a whole, that we are this web, everything's connected. So um, that scar in that very sensitive area is gonna be causing a pull, which is ultimately what is gonna cause um, the prolapse in the first place and prolapse just means to move out of position so one or more of your pelvic organs might have moved and then having a surgical repair I don't know whether that was done with mesh or not was it Joe? if you can just um if you can just let me know then that'd be great but any any surgery that's on there then is also creating more scar tissue so you know even though it's a repair and it might feel like it, it felt better for a while um then it's still creating scar tissue both mesh and after that a full repair yeah so so yeah mesh has its own kind of complications um i'm sure you know yourself with kind of the the material it's made of um twisting and torsioning in the body and actually bits of it breaking off and and going around the system and causing all sorts of autoimmune problems so um, once you've got that mesh in, it's probably, you know, it's it's going to probably do more damage than good in, in from what I know of mesh. But once you've got it there, um, it, it's a really tricky one to kind of work around. And what I would say is that in my experience with hyperpressives is that it helps release tension. But whether it would help release tension where you've got something in there that's kind of twisting and torsioning, I don't know. Um, but it would be worth giving it a try. I mean, I, that's what I say to everybody where I'm not sure about something is that it's not going to do you any harm. It's breathing and postures. So it's not like you've got, you know, you're not going to make things worse for yourself. Um, and whether you'll be able to gain, you should be able to gain some level of fitness, but how much you gain, whether you get back to where you were, I, I doubt very much. Uh, and I know that sounds like um, doom and gloom, but it, it's, I think it's working smarter and training smarter rather than trying to think about kind of going back to where you were really. Um, it's, I mean, you've asked me, will hyperpressives work for you? Uh, my answer to that is I don't know. It, you, or you've got nothing to lose trying it but I can honestly say I don't know whether with where you've had so much surgery in that area whether it would give you some relief what we would ideally want is that we got to you before you had that surgery um, and then I could definitely say that because we're not dealing with any other issues in that area then it, you would have got some symptom relief and you know potentially go back to um, some sort of fitness um, but it's really, really hard for me to say, Joe, because um, everybody's individual. We don't know how it's kind of affecting your body. Um, and the hope would be that, yes, it would really, really be helpful to do it. But I, I can't say yes and I can't say no. 
um, because I, I don't know until you try it. But you, you know, if you learn hyperpressives, you really need to give it a good two to three months of kind of consistent practice um, to really know whether you're getting any symptom relief or not. So that would be my suggestion is if you're interested, then give it a go, do it consistently, learn it properly, um, and then just kind of see where you are in two or three months time. Okay, so um, anybody else got any questions for me? Kasha, hello. Hi, Nikki, how are you? I'm good, it's lovely to see you. Kasha's in Poland. Yeah, hello everybody. <laughs> Hi, uh, I have a small question. Um, uh, if you do, Nikki, a few flows together, uh, how long break do you have between first and second one? So are you doing it one round in each hand position? Yes. If you, no, no. If you have all flow first and you want to do another flow to, uh, yes, to you know, that your session take more time. So how, it doesn't matter how long that break is. It's one minute or a few minutes more. No. No, it doesn't matter how long you... No, I mean, I, I usually say for people to do five, 10 to 15 minutes a day. Yeah. But if you wanted to do longer, a longer session, you'd just yeah. do two or three rounds of breath in some of the hand positions or all of them to extend it out. So if, for example, you did one round of breath in each of the hand positions in every posture in the flow, that takes you about seven or eight minutes, doesn't it? Depending mm -hmm. on how you're yes. your breath. So if you do two rounds, you're going to double that up. If you do three rounds, you're going to double that up and you're going to spend longer in those postures. So it's mm -hmm. going to be a lot harder. So you can kind of extend it like that. Yeah. And if you want to do a whole flow, take a break, do another whole flow, take a break, you can. Um, there's, I don't, I mean, I just think that if you do any longer than like 25, 30 minutes, it's quite boring and quite, and quite painful. So that's why I don't tend to teach it like that with, with people. I try and get them to do the shortest amount of time to get the maximum benefits because if they know they've got to do like 25 minutes of something that's going to absolutely kill them they won't do it <laughs> yeah. okay so so it's uh, so we have two choice yeah so uh, yeah you can do it in the hand or one part one round yeah minute break for example and another round extra more time yes but i would start to build up to it depends on kind of what you want but you could say if you found posture two, posture four, posture five easier, you could do yeah. more, more rounds of breath in those. So you could do one in all the others and then two or three in those just to extend it out a little bit. Just play okay. around with it really. Um, yeah. And then if you wanted to do another session at the end of the day, then it's, you're not doing yourself any harm at all. So you could do one at the beginning of the day, one at the end of the day. Um, okay, okay, great, thank you. I have one, one more question, okay? Yeah question uh, when we uh, teach people learn people or teach them teach. <laughs> sorry <laughs> so when we teach people uh, do um, that vacuum yes uh, so we we use uh, some um, association like uh, release uh, ribs uh, or smell a flower or something like this. Yeah, yeah. Do you have, do you have uh, or maybe you all have another words or association could help people to understand what they should do to, to, you know, to do that vacuum in your practice? Yeah, the thing being is it's kind of having to let go of the control because mostly people want to be able to do it. They want to be able to do something to get it. Yeah. But actually we're not trying to do anything to get it other than exhale fully, hold our breath and relax the tension. So I always say relax the tension at the ribs. So when we do that exhale, you're kind of bringing those ribs in and bracing the muscles around. Yeah. yeah. So you yes. do that full exhale. Yeah. Then they've just got to be able to release that. So, like I say, imagine sniffing a flower because that helps open the ribs. But you really don't want your client to be doing too much because they'll get into that headspace that they have to do something to achieve it. Whereas they don't, they just have to make sure they get rid of all the air, hold their breath, and relax. Okay. Yeah. For me, it's obviously. <laughs> but yeah. Problem. Yeah. I know what you mean. Um, Joanne, do you, what, what cues do you? What other cues have you used for that? 
Can you can you unmute yourself? Yes, hello. <laughs> what other what um other cues have you got have you used or you're just using the cues that I've given you? Well, I have literally just keeping it simple because that's exactly what I was doing wrong. Uh, when I so this is what I was doing. I was overthinking it for sure. And I've I have used the analogy of um sniffing a flower in the meadow. Yeah. Um, but in the meadow. I, I think the most in the meadow, important thing yeah. is to get people to fully exhale. That's the other thing I found really hard. Yes. And then to relax and be in the posture, obviously, like you know, stay with your yeah, um, stay within the posture. Alignment. But I think if I that's the biggest thing is to get people to relax. And I'm yeah. just like in the process of um, teaching quite a few people, you know, clients in sessions. So I'm trying to include the high progressives alongside the sessions. So yeah. I'm just trying to get them to, to take it on board and to regulate. And also it's quite hard as always with people to get people to consistently practice. Yeah, yeah. The thing, isn't it? Okay. okay thank you um thank you. what i would say is that sometimes when i've got someone lying down i will say to them do you understand how to relax your ribs and most people don't because we're so used to kind of really holding everything in here and clamping everything and pulling our pelvic floor up that they, they almost need permission to kind of let that tension let that holding that gripping go so when you're lying on the floor, when they're lying on the floor, you can say to them, like, like really brace your, your ribs together, really pull your ribs together, and then now release that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, And so uh, get them to get the feeling of what that feels like to be able to release that. And that's what you want at the end of that full exhale. So it's just getting them to understand that, that they don't, we don't want them to feel like they're holding everything and bracing. We actually want them to feel like they're um, allowing that to release. But okay. it's a tricky one because a lot of people won't get it. They they struggle with that side of it. They'll struggle with getting rid of all the air. They struggle with um, relaxing the tension. But yeah. Okay, I will try. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thank you. No problem. Uh, right. Okay. So let's just go back and read some of my questions. So Joe says, in your opinion, what should people do about their normal core exercises? Okay, so like things like sit-ups, um, planks, you know, I, I, I do a, a little boxing class myself and, I, and if I'm really honest, I don't do any of the core work that they give me in there. They're there doing full sit-ups, they're there doing butterfly sit-ups where they've got their legs apart and they're sitting up to the middle. I think even me, who I've got, you know, quite a nice functioning body because of hyperpressives, I still don't see the point because I don't want a six pack um, and they're not making my core stronger. Those exercises will be for people that want a six pack to pop. They want the muscles to pop out. And I'm not bothered by that. I'm quite happy with having a layer of fat over mine. So I think that traditional core exercises as people think about oh, I'm going to get a strong core by doing these sit-ups is actually um, the wrong thing to do for most people and actually will by doing lots and lots of sit-ups they're making them have shortened and tight muscles in their back or, or kind of lengthened and stretched sorry muscles in their back which ultimately will mean that they'll end up with with a bad back um, so in terms of if you've got someone that you know has dysfunction um, and that might be just be that their posture is is terrible then they shouldn't be doing traditional core exercises at all until they're strong enough until they've got a bit more of that function back and then if they want to do some of those it would be more rotational work so, so like wood chops and uh, russian twists and um, I mean, you can start to bring kind of side plank things into it, but I'd just be really, really careful with traditional core stuff when you know someone's got some level of dysfunction there, because it just won't be beneficial for them. And certainly with sit-ups, the, the increase in pressure, especially with something like a prolapse, is not going to be very helpful at all doing sit-ups. So well, I never do sit-ups, but so it could sit alongside, though, somebody's current plan, because trying to get anyone to change it first it's just going to be so that would be a struggle with some people yeah. so if well, you do it you can kind of, 
Yeah, you want to kind of um, modify first what they're doing so that they're not doing some of the worst stuff. Yeah, um, then they won't be. as well, explaining how hyperpressives is different and what, you know, ask them what they're doing their core exercises for. Because yeah. if, if it's for a strong core, then, then they're, they're doing it wrong. Yeah. Yeah, it's not, that's not going to give them properly functioning, stabilizing muscles. It's going gonna, it's gonna to increase weakness and give them back pain a lot of the time. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Okay, um, what else did you say? Does hyperpressives replace this or is it okay as well? Is it better for your body in an ideal world just to practice your hyperpressives with other strength? CV fit. I mean, you know, it can it can kind of run alongside everything you're doing once you're there. Mm -hmm. So, so say for example, in the early days of when I was teaching hyperpresses, I used to say, "Oh no, you've got to stop everything. You've got pelvic floor dysfunction. You need to stop doing all those things. They're going to make it worse. You must do your hyperpressive program first, rehab." So that turned a lot of people off of doing hyperpressives because they didn't want to give up what they were doing. They enjoyed what they were doing. And they didn't want to be told that that was making them feel worse. They just wanted to get on and, and do it alongside. So now I tend to tell people to train smart and not, and not actually do lots of damage to themselves. So say, for example, I might have a runner. Well, we all know that running isn't the greatest exercise if you've got pelvic floor dysfunction. So you try and work with them to say, well, like at the moment, you might be running five times a week. So what I would say is that maybe you should find three of those times a week when you're doing something other than running. So like maybe, for example, go on the cross trainer if you have access to one, because that's a much better, a much more low impact exercise. And you can still work hard um, swimming, anything that is much more low impact than running. Um, and then sort of say the two runs that you do do, can you just shorten down the time that you're doing um, and monitor your symptoms? And once you start getting someone into still working hard, still doing stuff that they enjoy, but just doing it smarter, it's the same with weight training, not lifting really big heavy weights, but doing more reps with a lower lower um, weight range or body weight. There's some real benefit in, in going back to basics and doing more body weight stuff. So I think as long as you don't just suddenly take things away, because I, I certainly turned a lot of people off of hyperpressives in the beginning by telling them that. Yeah. Um, it's just not very helpful when someone and I know myself I love my training if someone has said to me oh you you won't be able to do any of that for a while you know it's it's yeah so sometimes it's people's only kind of bit of um, escapism and, and and it's good for their mental health so um, you've just got to tell them to train a bit smarter maybe don't like do so much of the thing that we know is is causing the problem okay thank you Nikki no worries thank you uh, so Sandra says I've signed up to the Facebook uh, yeah the Facebook sessions it's in the Facebook group yeah 15 minutes a month uh, for the month should I do a bit of a warm-up before each session if so would something like a roll down in Pilates be okay so we I I wouldn't try and Sandra I wouldn't try and confuse the two things when you're trying to learn something what you'll see in the group is that I've structured the videos so that you do do a warm up. You'll do a breathing warm up, and it's very much focused around hyperpressive. So, when you're first learning, the first couple of days that we do are just about the breathing, and then when we start to learn the postures, I always do a bit of a breathing warm up. So, I don't think you need to be doing any other things alongside that. But if there are things that you normally do in the morning, like a mobility routine or any stretching or anything like that that you do, then then great if you if you know you've got some tight areas you can definitely do them before you watch the videos but I wouldn't kind of try and intermingle it in with hyperpressives at the moment because it's quite although it's once you've got it it's quite repetitive and in a way simple um, in the beginning there's lots to learn and it's kind of almost too much for your brain so um, so yeah hopefully I answered that yes I suppose you can do it before you do your video but don't kind of try and mix them up too much. Uh, let me know if I didn't answer that very well. <laughs> Pauline says, um, I'd like to sign up for the beginner's challenge beginning of March, tomorrow, how, oh, how do I pay? Yeah, do, you, do I need to ring your mobile? Please let me know. Okay, so Pauline, 
on our website, ukhyperpressives.com, you just go to training options and there's three options and you want complete beginners. So just click on complete beginners. And then that tells you all about what's included. You have to be on Facebook. So you have to have a Facebook account to join the private group. And then every day we get daily videos delivered or I deliver daily videos. Most of it's pre-recorded. So you don't have to worry about what time it's there. It's pre-recorded so that you can just watch it and do it whenever you have your time to do it. Sometimes there's lives. So if you want to find out when the lives are, I think I've got two coming up this new week. Um, just look on the schedule, which is pinned to featured. And then all of your videos are under guides in the Facebook page. Um, but just to reiterate, you do have to be on Facebook. I have said to uh, had people sign up before that um, aren't on Facebook and then they're quite surprised they can't access it. So there is no other way of accessing it um, other than on Facebook. Um, so go on our website, I would say. Book tonight and you'll probably get sent the link tomorrow now to join the group um, because it's quite late. <laughs> um, okay, so... Jo, yes, absolutely. Jo's just asking if um, she can view a recording. Yes, I'm recording it and it will be on YouTube. So no problem. Yeah, Sandra, I did answer your question. Good. Right. So anybody else got any questions? Um, Belinda, hello. Lovely to see you. Hi. Sorry, just unmute myself. Um, yeah, I've got a question on the postures, really, as to how they sort of originated. Um, you know, the, the, they're very formulaic in terms of, of where the arms go and so on uh -huh. and is that because they're designed to, to work different muscles in different ways or you know how what's the sort of rationale behind them so the postures are there and they mimic functional movement so when you think you have to stand in a good posture you have to kneel you have to bend over you have to be on all fours at some point, lay down, get up and down off the floor, um, seated cross-legged, maybe not legs extended, but all of these are kind of working on um, functional movement patterns. So that's the first thing with the postures. Mm -hmm. the second part of it is thinking about our body as this myofascial web. We've got tensions in our body when we have poor posture. So as I was talking about earlier, a lot of people are kind of quite hunched and um, as they get older, their shoulders creep up to their ears. Um, they become very internally rotated um, and that's due to habitual tension in the front of their body, whether that's from their job, from driving, from whatever it is, um, it's, that's, that's pulling their, them out of their optimal posture. So what those postures are doing is they're releasing tension where we don't need it so much and putting that tension where we need it a bit more. So Usually that is posterior chain, our stabilizing muscles in our back of our body, because that's the areas that we're being pulled forward and stretched. Mm -hmm. So we're releasing here and we're putting that tension into the posterior chain, into the back of the body. So that's why we focus very much on switching on these muscles here, the lats around the bra line, because they're really a, a very big stabilizing muscle responsible for stabilizing that shoulder joint. Yeah, so getting your scapula to sit nicely in your back will help your shoulders to be a better, better position, will help your head to be in a better position, and will start to release some of those tensions. So getting those lats to wake up in those arm positions by the tension through the elbows or the fingers is why we do those. Some of the forward slants, so like in standing and in kneeling when we're actually going on a forward position, we're creating more tension in the back of the legs so the posterior chain in the back of the legs to help to get the hamstrings and the glutes to work better for us as well so mostly we sit down we're, we're sitting down a lot more than you know we ever used to and that means that the glutes really switch off and they're really big muscles that should be working um, and you know they should work really really hard and they should take on a lot of the work of the back and, and a lot of the time when we don't have properly firing and properly working glutes, we end up with those back muscles getting really, really sore and tight. And that's why people end up with back pain. Um, so posterior chain it, engagement is important um, and release of tension in anterior chain is important. So hip flexors, chest muscles, shoulders, neck, all of this front of our body gets very, very tight 
and needs a good old release off. I mean, we can all, if I talk about posture in a group, of, you know, if I'm talking to a group of people, often you see people kind of sit up straight when I talk about posture, but then after about two or three minutes, they've collapsed back down into their seat, you know, back into their slump where their default is. So what we're trying to do with these postures is to be in them while we're doing hyperpressives and over time that becomes a repetitive pattern becomes a better habit body starts to learn brain starts to tell the muscles this is a better way to be i'm not in so much pain i'm able to hold myself up correctly etc cetera, etc cetera. and then we we do make those changes and usually we see those changes in postures really quickly so if you took a picture of yourself before you even started hyperpressives and then one in six weeks you'd see a change front side side back just to see what your posture is like it does make a massive change to posture and then those arm movements are all about really this mobility in the shoulder joint and this the shoulder joint can be a real one where people have problems as they age so frozen shoulder etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, so it's about keep blowing away the cobwebs and keeping that as a nice freely moving um, unit same with hips getting pelvis aligned um, in the postures getting getting the hips in a good position which is going to really help lower body as well so okay. it's not just made up <laughs> great question though thank you jane have you got a question for us no no questions uh ros have you got any questions for me you just just popped in just so you could see me <laughs> I can't hear you. You'll have to unmute if you're going to talk to me. Is that, can you hear me now? Yes. Hello. Hi. <laughs> um, well, my problem is, is I can't get down on the floor because of my double hip replacement. Yeah. Um, but I'm guessing now I have time. I have to start doing exercise, as you rightly said to me. <laughs> the thing is that if, if you don't use what you've got and you don't... I'm going to lose it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And um, th I'm not saying that having a double hip operation is, is an excuse, but, but there's plenty of modifications that we can do in terms of the postures so that you, you would be able to do some of it. You wouldn't be able to do all of it, but... No. Yeah, there would be some, because you, you know, yes, no, you can't get down on the floor like in a flow, but you would be able to get yourself down onto the floor and maybe sit on something or sit on the chair. So there are, that's the great thing with hyperpressives is, although you see these eight postures in the flow, that's not necessarily what you personally would yeah. do. We can kind of tailor it towards you. So yeah, it's just a case of starting really. <laughs> And I'm guessing no one will be seeing me getting up anyway. <laughs> no one sees you. So if you're doing the Facebook thing, you just do it and you follow me. You can see me, but I can't see you. So, yeah, you know, it's um, definitely you just got to get started. But that's the great thing with it. You know, I often have people that have knee operations and have, you know, other limitations and. gone <laughs> but it's lovely to see you <laughs> i think it was my sheer fluke <laughs> oh, it's telling me my internet is unstable for some reason yeah you keep freezing <laughs> oh no <laughs> well when I, I i was late on the um i was late on the meeting because I couldn't connect to the internet at all, which is ridiculous. It just my computer. Oh, went. I wonder. I uh, wondered because it was the first time I've ever tried it, and I just, just thought, no, I, I just have to stay with this because normally I would getting in a stress. But I can't do it. I can't do it. But and you did it. Well done. Yeah, I did it. <laughs> but because I, I feel a beginner, it feels like over my head. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, you'll you'll get what we're talking about when you start doing it, really. Right, so is there anybody else that has any questions? So we haven't heard from Liz. I don't know whether you've got a question. 
you can unmute yourself, Liz. We still don't need to see. Hi, you. evening. Hello. Yes. Sorry. Um, you're Sorry. on my. I'm using my phone, so I didn't know where the mute and unmute was. Um, so now I'm looking forward to the sessions. Um, one question. I noticed you've got two live sessions on the third and the seventh. I actually leave for work earlier, so. Yeah, would I be able to see them later? Absolutely. Or? Absolutely. That's so all of the sessions really that are in the group, even the pre-recorded ones, were ones that I did on a live at some point. So um I don't worry about it. If it's if it's a um I think most of them are 8 30, aren't they? Yeah. Yeah. So if they're on at 8 30, then once I've done it, it'll be there under guide for that day. Excellent. Thank you very much. So you don't have to worry about that. There all of the lives are there lovely thank you good um so have we no one got, no one got any more questions no nothing um well i i often get asked um how long how long is it going to take me before i start to see results and we kind of been asked that slightly um this evening but that's always a good one is that people say well how long before um i, I start to feel results what i would say is if you're quite new on your journey um, keep a little like symptom diary and that might be um, not necessarily uh, physical symptoms but also emotional symptoms so you know write down how it's affecting you what you can and can't do um, you know what what it stops you from doing how it makes you feel all of those things are really really important at the beginning because what you'll find is that some of those things will dramatically change quickly and you'll find that you know you just the fact that you're feeling like you're doing something positive for yourself will be a really big um, emotional shift um, and so often people have some really horrible symptoms and um, they don't really feel like their symptoms are reducing their actual physical symptoms but sometimes some of the things that they were being restricted by um, really really change so it's always really important to kind of have your own start point and really think about that. So a little diary of some sort with your symptoms and like what's going on with you on day one is a really good place to start as well as kind of postural photos. So just everyone's got a smartphone now, take a photo um, or get someone to take a photo of you just standing straight, standing with your back to them and then to one photo side, one photo side or sat cross-legged. So sat in some of the positions that we do just to kind of, see where you're at at the moment and then see where you're at in sort of five or six weeks because like I say often we're so desperate to kind of get rid of a problem it can take longer for the actual problem to go to start to go away and the symptoms to reduce but there'll be so many other nice things that are happening that you kind of forget those um, so yeah I'm often sort of asked how long but what I would say is if, if after three months of doing consistent practice you didn't have a relief in any of your symptoms, then you need to start thinking about adding something else in. Not necessarily taking hyperpressives away, but it just may be that it won't work so well on its own and that you may need to do scar release work. You may need um, an acupuncturist. You might need some CBD, uh, CBD, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy. That's the one. Um, so you might need, to, it might be an emotional thing that's, that's causing tension there. Um, so yeah, there's lots of other therapies. You might need to see a women's health physio, uh, a chiropractor, an osteopath. Um, I know myself, it wasn't just a one trick pony. Hyperpressives worked really, really well for me, but um, I also had the help of an osteopath and I also had the help of a women's health physio along the way. So um, there will, there may be for other things that you need to, other avenues you need to go down as well. Um, Joe, we've got another question. One of my clients has been doing it now for a few weeks and does not have to stop for a wee in the head during a run now. She's very pleased. <laughs> I'm sure she is. <laughs> I love it when you get those. It's really great. You need to make some little um, graphics testimonials and put that on there because you don't need to name her. You can just put one of my clients, literally just what you've written. It's a great one for people to read because it, it shows that it really, really can help. Yeah, that's amazing. Wonderful. Belinda, have you got a question? I've made you think of something now. No, um, not a question, but I was going to say, I've, I can't think how many months I've been doing hyperpressives for now. It's five. Hmm. It, it probably is about five months, yeah. I would say. Um, had a prolapse, 
I still have a prolapse, but I completely am totally asymptomatic now. So I have no symptoms whatsoever. Mm -hmm. um, so happy days is all yeah. I can say. Uh, um, and and thank you. That's the thing with, I mean, thank you for doing it consistently. You know, thank you for being such a great student, really, because, um, but that's the thing with hyperpressives is that often people come and they want, they don't want, they, they find it very shameful to have something like a prolapse, but often we can't make it go away. Um, it's just not physically possible, but we can help to, to them to get their life back and to be able to do things that they want to be able to do without worrying about it all the time. So um you know i think that's the key really that's why i was saying about the at the beginning about really thinking about how it affects you because um the thing is life goes so quickly doesn't it and then and you you know you're so many months down the line you're very focused in on on like well what's going on with my prolapse i've still got it but like you just said you're asymptomatic so that's really the best place to be isn't it yeah. and just continue to do it because i think a lot of the time it's like that uh, you go to the, you, you have a problem with your knee, you go to the physio, physio gives you some exercises, you religiously do them and you go back and have more treatment and then eventually you, your knees feel so much better and it doesn't feel painful and you, so you carry on with your life and you stop doing the exercises and then hey presto, it, 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 um, your knee starts to hurt again and you start to have problems with it. So it's the same with hyperpressors, you just need to keep doing it and I know that sounds boring but everyone's got 10 to 15 minutes a day just to find time to do a little bit of exercise that's going to help keep them at a place where they can go on and enjoy life into their old age and isn't that what we all want i think so i think that's a great place to finish don't you unless anybody's got another question i've got no more questions in my chat box here we've had some great questions today thank you guys it's been really great awesome to see you all Thank you for taking your time out tonight to come and join me. Um, it will, it is being recorded, so it will be out on YouTube um, very soon. Nice thumbs up there to you, Sandra, too. Uh, and um, hopefully some of you will sign up. Some of you are already signed up and um, some of you are teaching it, which is amazing. So yes, thank you very much for joining me. Have a great evening, guys, and I'll see you all again soon. Thank you.